if, if it had been looked at, maybe someone saw it and say, oh, this just, it's, it's a bummer they threw it out because they just dismissed it uh, in a wrong-headed way. With the right-headed way of beginning to look at it and finding that there was, in fact, carbon-14 in diamonds and coal um, without contamination in the samples, uh, with right-headed thinking, then you begin to get to the right answers. And with diamonds being formed, and this is agreed upon by all secular scientists, many, many miles below the surface of the earth, generally, uh, the fact, and it being the hardest rock that there is, contamination is more difficult to occur because of those factors and probably some others that I don't know about. But in any case, any, any diamond they tested, they found carbon-14 in. And the diamonds, they say, are supposed to be about two and a half billion with a B for boy years old. But you can't detect carbon-14 after 50 to 100,000 years. About 100,000 years. At yeah, max, yeah, at yeah, max. Yeah, yeah. And so they found amounts of carbon-14 indicating that those diamonds were less than 100,000 years old. And that throws everything out of whack in terms of, of their secular scientists dating the age of the Earth. Well, in any case, let's go to this section of film. This, excuse me, this section of film is about 28 minutes long, a little longer, quite a bit longer than we usually show these days. But it's complex, and I wanted you guys to get a really good chunk of, of, of this material behind you. And Snelling was part of the, the rate project and he knows this stuff inside and out. And as he points out, this research is continuing, and we're just on a section, a section of the film. He's got a lot more in there as well. So with that, this is about 28 minutes long. We'll see you in about 28 minutes and take any questions, comments that you might have at that time. See you then. And it becomes a helium atom. And so for every uranium atom that decays, you actually produce how many? Eight helium atoms from every one of those steps, those eight steps where an alpha particle is produced. However, in the biotite crystals, the zircon crystals embedded in them are usually very tiny. One micron is less than the thickness of a human hair, so it's quite small, but it's visible under a microscope. And these alpha particles shoot out like little bullets from the zircon crystal into the surrounding biotite. And as I said on Tuesday night, it's like taking a gun and firing a bullet through a plasterboard. It leaves a trail of damage. And that trail of damage discolors the biotite crystal. And so this is called, uh, this discoloring, as you can see in this photograph, you can see the central, the central zircon crystal there and you can see all the damage, the discoloration. This outer ring is the most energetic alpha particle that makes it out that distance. This area in here is all dark. You can't distinguish the other rings because this has had so much radioactive decay, it's blurred, blurred all the damage together. And so we call, of course, this is happening in three dimensions. So in reality, it's a sphere of damage. But when we examine the rock, the biotite is flakes that are stacked up on top of one another like a book, of the pages of a book. And so when we collect the samples and separate the biotite crystals, we pull the leaves apart. Until, and so we're only looking in the, on the page of the book. So you have to imagine that there's all these sections through this sphere. And you have to get through the central one, the central page that has the zircon crystal on it to identify the halo. Otherwise, if you miss that, you could be thinking it's a smaller halo and misidentify it. I can see some heads nodding, so that's a good sign. Okay. As I said on Tuesday night, each of these bullets travel different distances because the the parent daughter, the daughter then becomes a parent that spits out a daughter, and they each eject alpha particles at different energies for each step in this process. And so you can see in this diagram the list of the atoms that spit out the alpha particles, and you can see the energies. The most energetic one is the polonium-214, and so that's that outer ring there because the bullet has traveled the furthest distance. It's like having different guns. 
that will fire the bullets different distances. Now because most of the damage is done when the bullet comes to rest, normally you expect to see eight rings, as in this photograph here. And that's the giveaway. You can count those rings and you can measure the diameter of those rings or the, the, the radii of those rings and you can work out which ring corresponds to which element because of the different energies involved. And so you can easily identify that the most energetic ring, or the one that has the most energy, sorry, the bullet that has the most energy is polonium-214 and so that will be the outer ring and so on. Now, of course, the pioneer in this work was uh, Dr. Robert Gentry, but before him, they were studied, uh, particularly in the 1930s in Canada. Uh, Henderson uh, did some work on these halos, but never fully comprehended their significance or what they were. It has been determined that to, form a fully, uh, to fully form a dark uranium radio halo, like the one that you see there on the screen, requires 500 million to a billion alpha particles. So you have to have that many bullets being shot out into the biotite crystal around to produce enough darkened, damaged areas and those rings for it to be visible under a microscope. So when you see one that's blurred, the rings are blurred, you know you've had even more alpha particles than that. And 500 million to a billion alpha particles is equivalent to 100 million years worth of radioactive decay at the rate we measure today. Now, please do not misunderstand me on this point. I'm not saying the millions of years happened or existed. All I'm saying is that if the decay was slow like it is today, then to produce 500 million to a billion alpha particles would take 100 million years. That's at the rate, slow rate we measure today. So that tells us that when we see a halo in a biotite crystal in a granite, this is physical evidence, literal, observable physical evidence that radioactivity has really occurred. And a lot of radioactivity, a lot of radioactivity. In this instance, with the photograph of this halo, a hundred million years worth as measured at today's rate. And we have found in this research that granites around the world contain these dark uranium radio halos. I said on Tuesday night, I've had samples now from five continents. And whether it's in the Grand Canyon or it's in, it's in southern Australia or in southeastern Australia, in England or here in the United States, we find these dark uranium radio halos. So around the world, we find granites that contain observable physical evidence of abundant nuclear decay. However, in many granites, we find in the same biotite flakes as the dark uranium radio halos, and the one here you see on the left on your screen is a dark uranium radio halo. Again, you see the rings are blurred, which means there's been in excess of 100 million years. There have been so many alpha particles that it's blurred those rings. Everything's become dark. But alongside that, in fact, almost superimposed on it is a smaller halo, also very dark, but it only has one ring. It's much smaller. And because of, because of its radius or diameter, whichever way you want to measure it, we can actually work out what element was responsible for producing that radio halo. But more of that in a moment. And in some granites, we find not only the dark uranium radio halos, but two, two ring radio halos. This one here, you can see the dark outer ring, uh, sorry, the light outer ring and the dark inner ring. 